Now, let's start the third session on facing a global growth store, searching for macro inventions. The chair of this session is Professor Barry Eichengreen from the University of California, Berkeley. Please welcome Professor Eichengreen. Dr. Choi, thank you. Um, strengthening growth potential in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. So in order to do this, or even to think about it, we have to uh, think more about growth potential and, and um, what we know about it. We had a little bit of discussion this morning about um, growth potential in the short run, and I suppose the way to think about this session is growth potential in the not-so-short run. Um, we have um, two speakers eminently uh, qualified to speak on it, uh, Professors Jill Mokier and, and Robert Gordon. And I remind you, gentlemen, that the program says 20 minutes for the initial presentation, 10 minutes. I, I remind you, gentlemen, that the, that the program says 20 minutes and 10 minutes for the discussions, uh, discussions followed by open discussion. So, Jill, please. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to do something very different from all the other papers at this conference, I hope. And um, not just talk about the past, but talk about the remote past. Uh, before I do so, I'll give you a little bit of, of a motivation. Um, I'm having a fairly prolonged debate with my learned colleague, uh, Bob Gordon, about the future of uh, technology uh, in the world. Uh, there is this uh, new wave of what I call techno-pessimism. In all fairness... Uh, to Bob and, and, and his soulmates, uh, of course, nobody's quite predicting that technology is going to, technological change is going to disappear or slow down to nothing or anything like that. I think the argument is some kind of mix between it doesn't, it isn't quite what it used to be and uh, even if it is, it's not going to be strong enough to offset these headwinds that everybody sees are coming and are going to, uh, reduce our uh, GDP growth rates uh, from 2% to something much, much uh, smaller than that. And so the question really is, uh, to some extent, is the world running out of good ideas and have these low-hanging fruits uh, been picked? Uh, and so I'm going to give you a, a long-term perspective on this, taking you back not 50 or 100 years like in the previous section, but, but, but more than that, um, trying to persuade you that I don't know what technological progress is going to look like in the next uh, 50 years, uh, any more than anybody else does, uh, but I can at least look at history and try to isolate one or two factors that I think have been critical in bringing about what we would call today sort of modern technology or, you know, modern science or whatever you want to call it, uh, and then ask myself, well, if you really believe that these factors are important, uh, what can we prognosticate about them? Now, I'm not going to talk about everything, and it would be most, perhaps natural for an economist to talk here about incentives uh, and institutional structures and, and see what, what makes people who come up with new ideas work. I won't do that uh, in my presentation, but I hope somebody asked me a question about it. Uh, I'm going to talk about something slightly different, uh, and you'll see where, where I'm taking this. But if my central argument is very straightforward, which is um, the low-hanging fruits have not been picked, and even if they have been picked, it is the function of science to build taller and taller ladders so we can get up higher uh, in the tree. These trees will also be fertilized, and, you know, we can, we can drive this metaphor into the ground if you want, but you see where I'm taking this. Uh, now, there's all these headwinds that uh, people talk about. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this right now, uh, except to say that I think that the tailwind from technological uh, from change is likely to be so powerful that will come all of those headwinds uh, and other factors. Um, now, I don't know what GDP growth is going to be like. I don't know what TFP growth will be like, which is derived from it. In fact, I'm, the handicap I'm running against is that there aren't any good quantitative measures of technological progress. The two most widely used are, are TFP calculations or some kind of input measures such as research and development spending or patent counts. Uh, I'm extremely skeptical of all those measures. Uh, instead, uh, what I'd like to do is what I do best, which is tell you a story. So here's the story. There's two factors that mattered in the past. 
And I will explain exactly what they are. These terms may look a bit, uh, a, a bit weird. Um, they're called artificial revelation and access cost. And I'm going to talk about both. So what is artificial revelation? So the term I borrow from a very famous historian of science called uh, Derek Price. And it's basically the idea that technological progress, insofar as, 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 as we can uh, observe it, uh, depends, of course, on science advancing, but it is a very powerful feedback effect. And in fact, that science itself, and especially that science which is instrumental in creating new technology, uh, is itself a function of the tools and instruments that are at its disposal, which in themselves are, of course, technological in nature. And so, um, as technological progress advances, it sort of pulls itself up by the bootstrap through this positive feedback loop in which technology affects science and science then affects technology in its, in its, in its turn. And so, I've written a book about the fact that in the last, say, 150 years, that feedback mechanism has become much stronger and, in fact, may have reached a point where it becomes explosive and no longer converges to any sort of known um, uh, steady state. So let me give you some justification of the fact that uh, tools and how important tools and instruments uh, uh, are important. Uh, they're important... In, Largely because, you know, we are human and our brains and our senses are too limited to do much of what we need to do uh, to know uh, things about nature. So we can, we can uh, much of nature operates at, at, at scales of frequency and bandwidths that we cannot observe. Our senses are way too crude to measure things with accuracy, uh, things like temperature, air pressure, and so on and so forth. And some things we can't measure at all, like air pressure. Uh, it's also way too com to, uh, complex to compute, but of course we can simulate it. Now, the concept of artificial revelation, its best illustration is in perhaps in what happened during the so-called scientific revolution in the 17th century, and everybody learns in high school how Galileo grabbed the first telescope to look at, uh, at stars, and how uh, Robert Hooke uh, used the microscope to observe insects, and so on and so forth. Um, I want to give a few more uh, examples like that, but ones that are slightly lesser known. Here's one. This is the famous air pump bit, uh, um, built by Robert Boyle, who was Hooke's employer, in the, in the late 1650s, and this is what it looked like at the time. Um, this is an extremely interesting and important tool for scientific progress, because for, the, for once and for all, this tool shows that Aristotle's uh, presumption that there's no such thing as a, as a vacuum is false because they created the vacuum. And, of course, steam power is, for its first century at least, based on the principle of a vacuum. So if you are, <laughs> like Aristotle, believe there's no such vacuum, uh, you wouldn't go try and build a steam engine. This machine helped persuade people that, in fact, Aristotle uh, was just wrong about that. Here's a very different tool. This is much later. This is 1800. This is Volta's pile. This is the first battery ever built uh, by anybody. And, of course, it doesn't run anything technological for another century or more because there's, because there's no applications for it. But what it is, and what it is used for, is electrolysis. And around 1800, electrolysis is critical because this is sort of a few decades after the Lavoisier revolution explained the structure of chemistry and that we can isolate elements and make this sharp distinction between elements and compounds. And in fact, the Volta's pile was used, in particular in England by a man called Humphrey Davy, to actually build the new chemistry. By 1830, 1840, many of the elements have been isolated, in large part through to um, electrolysis. So this is a classical tool that makes science better. Here's another one, uh, slightly later. This is uh, the achromatic microscope. This was built by a man called Joseph Lister, not the famous surgeon, but his father. Um, and this is a tool that basically was used in some permutation by Koch and Pasteur to isolate uh, what we call today the germ theory of value, is the germ theory of disease. And uh, that's a critical step, the most critical step in uh, medical history ever. That was made possible by this microscope. The previous microscope had too much distortion. You could never see bacteria and identify them in a sort of Koch sense. Okay? Now, what about our own age? What do we know about artificial revelation in our own age? And, you know, you just you look around wherever you want to go, 
and science's toolkit has grown exponentially. Uh, this cannot but lead to rapid applications uh, in many fields that are uh, 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 as wide as, you can, as the eye can see. I'm going to give you two or three examples just to drive this home. Okay, now start with telescopy just in honor of Galileo. These are two pictures of the uh, planet Uranus. Take a, a close look at the left one and the right one. The left one was made with an ordinary telescope. The right one was made with one uh, in which blurring caused by atmospheric distortions are corrected through uh, uh, adaptive optics. Um, adaptive optics technology is going to be huge in astronomy um, because it changes the um, a more potential observing with accuracy than Hubble's telescope and is a heck of a lot cheaper. Okay, here's one that probably many of you have seen. These are automatic gene sequencing machines. They were first developed in 1986 in, in, at, at Caltech. And without that, our science of genomics wouldn't go anywhere if we had to do this all, uh, all by hand, as was done in, uh, in an earlier time. And of course, then there is that ultimate tool of research, uh, which is the computer. Now, you know, any, everybody that I know of who works in science, all the way from you know, English and, and philosophy departments to and, and science uses to computers, the question really is how was science and technology ever possible uh, without it? What did we do before? So here are two examples that maybe aren't quite as, 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 as obvious. Uh, one is our sort of multi-scale models of complex chemical systems, which allows us to solve, at least, or at least to simulate, the complex equations that govern uh, uh, quantum chemistry. This is what actually the Nobel Prize was given to in, uh, 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 last year. Now that is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a breakthrough. And the reason it's a breakthrough is because material sciences define our uh, uh, economic existence more than anything else. It's not for nothing that we talk about the Iron Age, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and so on. It's the fundamental thing from which stuff is made. Now, in the past, materials were improved exclusively through trial and error processes. You know, you monkeyed around in an iron and you hammered it for uh, six months, you got something called steel. Uh, we no longer will do that. Uh, we can now simulate uh, <laughs> these quantum mechanics equations and basically uh, design new materials, custom made, in silico, on screens, before we actually have to go into the experimental stage. Now, it does still means, of course, that you need to test. But remember, uh, 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 Sony was, had test, was testing the sort of lithium uh, batteries for 20 years until they became operational. It will now, a similar project will be a matter of months, not years. That makes a huge difference. Here's one other example which I like. And this is turbulence. Turbulence is an extremely difficult problem in science um, with that vast technological applications. Um, it's an also an, a very, very difficult analytical problem. Here's a quotation from an English mathematician, Horace Lamb, who said uh, that, the, uh, that the two problems in which he was hoping for a solution in heaven uh, 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 were ele quantum electrodynamics and the other was turbulent motion of fluids. About the former, I'm very optimistic. The latter is much more difficult. And that's because there are a system of partial equations that turn out to be extraordinarily difficult to solve. We can now, for the first time, amass enough computer to solve these equations. The applications to weather prediction, to the control of flooding control, to hundreds of issues that come up uh, all over the world uh, is going to be huge. All right. So I hope I convinced you that these tools are going to create a new world of science that itself will feed back into this technological process in the way I described it. Now let me say something about access costs. Okay. And first, make a very simple uh, theoretical argument. Uh, if you wanted to know what total social knowledge is, what is it that a society knows at any given point of time? The only definition I could ever come up with is the union of what everybody in society knows. Uh, so if one person or very few people know something, it is already part of social knowledge. That's why we talk about discovery. You know, one day uh, uh, Galileo discovers you know, the, uh, the moons of Jupiter, and that becomes part of social knowledge. Knowledge, even so, there must be some instances in which the only person who knew this was Galileo Galilei. Um, now, one corollary of, the, of this definition is immediately uh, is that it is so important to have access because if 
the knowledge exists in society, and I don't need to know it, but I need to, okay, how costly is it for me to find out, how costly is it for me to find out and actually acquire that knowledge from that person. And so, for a whole bunch of, the, of, the, uh, of reasons, it's terribly important to have access, not only because technology needs access to best practice science, but also because you want to, you know, you uh, you want to know what others have done before you so that you don't reinvent more wheels than is absolutely necessary. And furthermore, because a lot of technology advances by, as, as Matt Ridley has called it, by ideas having sex with one another, right? So ideas get combining together to create a third idea in the sort of models that Marty Weitzman and others have, have described. And so if knowledge is going to be accessed, it has to be organized. It has to be organized if access is going to be fast and cheap, so, because these access costs matter. And what I want to argue is that we have a good historical precedent that the, uh, says that the Industrial Revolution was preceded by a sharp fall in these access costs. And I'm going to give you one or two uh, historical examples of here. Okay? One of them is that the great invention of the 18th century uh, was the encyclopedia. The encyclopedia was the Google of the Age of Enlightenment because alphabetized encyclopedias and these indices to inter technical books uh, made it possible for you to find out what was being done and what was known. So here's a famous picture of Diderot's encyclopedia. It's a D paradigmatic Enlightenment document. And it's not just full of articles about religion and human rights, it's full of technical description. This is the famous description of pin making that is supposedly but not demonstrated to have inspired Adam Smith's first chapter. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. There, is, there are hundreds and hundreds of books written like that in this period. Here is part of the description des arts et métiers. This is 82 volumes published in Ancien Régime France about anything you can imagine from glass making to beer brewing. Uh, this is about velvet making. I picked this more or less at random. But you can see how these books are being made available and even within the book they're easy to access. I could go on about this, but I, I'm going to skip for the, sake, for the sake of time and lots of other examples that you can find. Uh, now, what this basically helps explain is the uh, ever-growing combination of science and technology in the late 18th, early 19th century, which basically allowed industrialization to take off in a process we call uh, the Industrial Revolution. So what about today? And I'd like to, and I don't think this will take a lot of work, to convince you that one of the things that ICT has done more than anything else has to re is, is reducing access costs. Uh, we no longer deal with data. We deal with metadata. We use this astonishing, overwhelming uh, quantity of information. You know? We can literally search for nanoscopic needles in haystacks the size of Montana uh, uh, and do so immediately. Now, that has some worrisome consequences, and these are being talked about a great deal with you know, issues of privacy and so on. But for science, this is huge because you can have access to findings, to databases that, that, that are just mind-bogglingly large. Okay? We think about these, these terms. You know? We no longer talk about uh, 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 megabytes. We have petabytes and zettabytes and yottabytes and even brontobytes. I don't know what brontobytes are, but they do exist. And so this, what this results in is what Mark Ridley has said, you know, the cross-fertilization of ideas between, say, Asia and Europe, which used to take centuries, uh, now takes minutes. And I think that's a little overstatement. It's faster than that. So access costs have declined both for what is known as tacit knowledge, as to say knowledge that is passed personally from people, uh, between people, and formal or quantifiable knowledge in uh, databases and, and uh, uh, websites. And so there are these vast number of databases. I have a whole list of them, but I don't have time to go through them. The most famous in, in medicine, for instance, is PubMed, which now has 23 million citations to biomedical literatures. Uh, all kind of data about each disease in, in, uh, in genetics and on and on and on. Any scientist working today in, in life sciences has to have access to these data, and they can at uh, zero or, or, or negligible uh, marginal cost. Yes, uh, more da data sources, you know. I mean, we could, I could go on, on uh, like this forever. Now, the main thing then is that this, this data, this, these data are available basically at the click of a mouse. 
You know, Louis Pasteur never had it so good. Uh, this is this is just mind-boggling, and it's unimaginable that this is not going to feed back in a rapid acceleration of growth. It's true in every field you can see, including, for that matter, and to a great extent, in my own field in, in uh, economic history. So where will all this technology be heading? Well, we have surely picked some low-hanging fruits in electric light and water chlorination and other things that Bob Gordon will, uh, will tell you about. But I think there's a whole set of areas in which, and I'm not going to go through each of them because we'll, I will take the rest of the afternoon, in which I think these things will show up. I cannot predict which of those six areas the, the, uh, the growth will be fastest and which well, there will be no growth. But I would say this. If, if just three of those six fields okay, are subject to the forces I'm talking about, the technological world in which we'll all be living in 10, 20 years will be radically different from what, it is, from what it is today in, in basically every dimension of, uh, of human existence. Now, do we need all this technology? Okay? And, the, and, and I, I have a strong argument that we do. And I'll talk about all, all this if, if anybody asks me a question. But let me just sum up because I'm, I think I'm running out of time. Okay? I strongly object to the view that we are basically somewhere where the Roman Empire was in the late third century or Qing China or, and we're about to you know, start languishing in some age of decline. Uh, there is no evidence that I can see that technological progress is running into any kind of ceiling or even diminishing returns um, and that economic growth, whether it's traditional uh, national income accounting definition or some much revised and much needed uh, revision will take place, I don't know. But here is a statement which I stand by, okay, which is the digital age will be to the analog age what the Iron Age was to the Stone Age. And we can't even imagine what the post-digital age will look like any more than Archimedes could imagine CERN. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert Gordon. Good. This has a laser pointer. Um, you're you're going to get some data now, uh, much less economic history. Uh, first of all, the, the program says that we're going to discuss slowing U.S. economic growth in a global context. Uh, I actually don't approve of discussing global growth in a global context because conditions in all the regions and the countries within the regions are so different. The U.S. has carved out the technological frontier for the world since 1870. So it matters for global growth what happens next in the U.S. The level of labor productivity in Western Europe and Japan almost caught up to the U.S. by 1995, but in the last 19 years has slipped back by a significant amount. So the rest of the world really does care what happens at, in the United States. The four tigers, including Korea, China, are all at different stages uh, of catching up, and it's, uh, I will not talk about them at all today. Now, the standard definition of growth is the percentage annual change in real GDP per capita. Uh, there's a high hurdle we have to um, surpass going out into the future. Uh, that is, from 1897 to 2007, uh, growth was 2.0 percent, actually uh, it was closer to 2.1 percent. And here is a summary of the implications of what I've been working on. Uh, comparing the 80, uh, the uh, 116 years before 2007 to the 25 years after 2007, I'm predicting that productivity growth goes down from 2.2 to 1.3, real GDP per person from 2.0 to 0 0.9. That bigger gap is due in, in large part to demography that we talked about in the last session. Uh, real GDP per person for the bottom 99% from 2 to 0 0.4, and the disposable income for the bottom 99% from 2 to 0 0.2. And the previous session was very well timed because a number of th the things that are happening down at the bottom of those numbers have already uh, been previewed. So in talking about slowing U.S. growth, it's important to distinguish the headwinds versus innovation. Um, 
The headwinds have nothing to do with innovation. They are relatively uncontroversial. Most of them started happening before the financial crisis. And indeed, everything that I'm predicting about those slowdown in growth we just saw were well underway before the financial crisis. And so this is different than David Turner's attempt to estimate the effect of the crisis itself on uh, potential GDP. Of the total 1.8% predicted slowdown for real GDP per capita for the bottom 99%, their disposable income after taxes and transfers, fully two-thirds, that is 1.2 out of the 1.8, uh, is related to the headwinds. Now, I'm not predicting that innovation is going to slow down, as Joel knows. What I emphasize is that innovation already slowed down 40 years ago. And if we work out the numbers and just predict that innovation as represented by TFP growth or uh, labor productivity growth adjusted for education, uh, if that continues out at the same rate as it has for the last 40 years, uh, that will be enough to account for the other 0 0.6 uh, points of the slowdown. So summary, 1.8 slowdown, two-thirds headwinds, one-third innovation that already happened uh, 40 years ago. Now, here's an irony. What's bad for the U.S. may not be so bad uh, for other developed nations uh, because the headwinds include demography, which we just heard about, education, inequality, debt, globalization, energy, and the environment. Headwinds are nation-specific. We just saw in the previous session that the effect and magnitude of the aging population has very different effects in different countries. The demographic headwind may indeed, as the previous session showed, have bigger effects and create more problems in Western Europe and Korea and Japan uh, than in the U.S. But on the other hand, some of the other headwinds, particularly our education problems and our inequality problems, um, are uh, likely to be more severe in the U.S. Now that contrasts the nation-specific nature of the headwinds, contrasts with uh, the free good of innovation. That is, everybody in this room is using the same uh, tablets and smartphones and other electronic gadgets. And it doesn't matter whether they were invented in Korea, in Japan, in the United States. They become very rapidly a, not a free good, but a good available to anyone uh, who can pay for them. So we start with a standard identity. We're interested in figuring out what's going to happen to the growth rate of output per capita, Y over N. By definition, that's equal to output per hour or productivity times hours per capita. Um, productivity growth combines the role of innovations uh, with educational attainment. The standard of living can grow faster than productivity if hours per capita grow. And that indeed is what happened from 1965 to 1995 as women entered the market workforce. And the reverse can happen also. Hours per capita can start falling faster uh, if the baby boomers retire and if we have some other aspects of U.S. demographics, as we'll see. So hours per capita went up for a long time and buffered income per capita growth from slowing productivity. And now we're going into a period where um, hours per capita are going to be falling faster and thus making uh, economic growth slower. But the decline in hours per capita this coming, that's already begun, uh, is about more than just baby boomers. We have had an insidious long-term decline in labor force participation and employment of the male population, we call them prime aged, uh, age 25 to 54. Uh, youth aged 16 to 24, their employment to population ratio fell from 65% in 1988 to 46% two years ago, and only one-third of that decline is accounted for by more of them being in school. Female labor force participation rose to a peak of 58% in 2000 and now has begun to fall back as well. This is the chart for uh, men, 25 to 54. Here's their labor force participation rate uh, going from 97% in 1960 to about 88% recently uh, and their employment to population ratio steadily going down with, of course, a big drop due to the financial crisis. But right up to here, Comparing to right back there, you see the foundations for this particular headwind were well underway before the crisis and had uh, nothing really to do with it. Now, the United States has a stack as big as your uh, highest skyscraper, 
uh, problems in education. High school completion rates, as Jim Heckman has, has argued, have barely changed since 1970. Most people who go to two-year community colleges drop out. College completion is slowly, slowly rising, but 40% of recent graduates have failed to obtain a job which requires a college degree. The U.S. is the only developed country where educational attainment in the 55 to 64 age cohort is the same as the 25 to 34 year old cohort. And as other countries have uh, caught up with college completion, we have slipped down the league table to number 16, and we're roughly in the same place for high school uh, dropouts. I use a number from Harvard's Dale Jorgensen on the effect of all this. It will reduce economic growth in the future by roughly 0.3% uh, per annum. Uh, the third headwind inequality is pretty familiar stuff these days with uh, Piketty's book. Uh, the Piketty and Saez data show that uh, over the two decades up to 2012, the real income of the bottom 99% of the U.S. population grew at half a point slower every year than the income growth of the average. And up until now, we've just been talking about the average. So we have to deduct this to the extent that we care about what's happening in the bottom 99%. And this rise in inequality is continuing inexorably. Just count the ways. Count the number of uh, sports figures who are routinely being offered annual salaries of 10 to 15 million. Uh, count the ways that Caterpillar and Boeing have been pushing for lower wages, two-tier wage contracts, shaving pension and medical care benefits. Uh, firms continuously, particularly in the U.S. medical care environment, are trying to push their employees into part-time work, which do not pay benefits, uh, and we have the current uh, debate about the minimum wage. Um, now, there are some uh, uncomfortable interactions between demographics, education, and inequality uh, that I first learned about from Charles Murray's book, Coming Apart which, because he had been accused of being a racist 20 years ago, he said, okay, I'll write a book about the white population, not mention any other uh, ethnic groups. And he divides the white population into a top part, which he calls Belmont, after the uh, suburb of Boston and Fishtown. It's the bottom 30%. Uh, it's a poor area of Philadelphia. And he chronicles social stability in Belmont and social decay in Fishtown. Uh, I could give you lots of his numbers. They're all very striking. But the one that really grabs me is the percent of children of women aged 40 living with both biological parents changing over the last 50 years. A little bit of a decline in Belmont, but a collapse in Fishtown from 95 to 35 percent. This interacts with education. There's no better prediction of high school dropping out than for a child, particularly in poverty, to grow up without a father. Um, now, we've had a lot of debate in the United States about preschool education, and that debate is focused on the gigantic vocabulary gap between the upper half of the population as their kids arrive in kindergarten compared to the poverty population. The vocabulary of the better-off kids is two to three times, maybe more times higher than that of the poverty families. Just a, a couple of uh, additional notes about problems of American education. In the Chicago public schools last year, 20% of the children in the entire city school district were absent for more than one month during the academic year, and only 12% went on to receive any college degree. And by now, most of us have heard about the latest uh, OECD-run PISA test results. Uh, the U.S. did uh, abysmally in reading uh, science and especially in math. And then finally, something that will be no surprise to anybody who sat through the last session, uh, we have uh, the baby boom retirement and this dropping of participation in working years. This is going to put uh, burdens on future federally financed Social Security pensions, on future federally financed medical care expenditures. Uh, and if we don't uh, enjoy looking at a trajectory for the federal debt-to-GDP ratio that looks like this out to uh, 2038, then uh, we're going to have to have some mix of higher taxes, lower growth, and transfers that will uh, reduce further the disposable income of the bottom 99 percent. And that doesn't even include uh, the many state and local governments that have huge pension liabilities, including the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. 
So at all levels of government, we're facing a future of faster growth in taxes and slower growth in benefits. Now, this graph goes from 1891 to 70 years after 2007. And I chose 70 years because of the rule of 70, uh, something that grows at 2% a year, quadruples in 70 years. Uh, and so our GDP per capita could grow from about 50,000 to 200,000 uh, if we were to continue the historic growth rate that goes back to 1891 of 2.0 per year. But if you subtract all my headwinds, you only get 0 0.8. And let's do a close-up and see how we're doing now compared to 0 0.8. Red is the actual values. And here I've shortened the horizontal axis. Now we're just looking at 1992 to 2013. Uh, and you'll notice the growth slowed down already after 2000 to 2007. Uh, we're way below the green line. We're be below even the pessimistic black line of 0 0.8. And this is actual U.S. real GDP per capita. But that little gap in there between the red and the black line is misleading because the black line includes the effect of rising inequality, whereas the red line does not. The red line is an average. And if you took account of rising inequality, the red line would be even lower, the right data uh, don't exist. So now it's time to switch from the headwinds to the outlook for innovation. And this will overlap more with, uh, with Joel. Standard growth accounting uh, divides up growth and labor productivity into the contributions of growth and labor quality, the effects of capital deepening, and a residual called total factor productivity, or TFP, that is a residual of everything that makes production more efficient, including innovation. But Capital deepening really doesn't count. It's endogenous to TFP or innovation itself. As Evzi Domar famously remarked more than 50 years ago, to have capital accumulation without technical change is to pile wooden, one wooden plow on top of another wooden plow. Diminishing returns would set in, and you wouldn't get any uh, capital deepening at all. So growth in labor productivity really reflects the effects combined of education and underlying uh, innovation. Over the same period since 1891, we've got four distinct eras of labor productivity growth. We have an 80-year uh, long period with an average growth rate close to 2.4. We have the famous productivity slowdown the next 24 years, 1.38. Then we have the so-called dot-com productivity growth revival uh, up to 2.54. And then we have the last nine years, which is even worse than what we used to call the dismal uh, slowdown. Now, let's just average together those last three periods so that we can highlight this remarkable change that happened uh, after 1972. Uh, if you do the math with compound arithmetic, the level of productivity in 2012 was 12 times higher than it was in 1891, and fully nine out of those 12 times had occurred by 1972. Uh, and that's the sense in which I think innovation is slowing, not from the last 40 years, but from the last 120. Uh, here are just a few of the things. I'll just skip through these and highlight some of the most important. These, I think, are the reasons why productivity growth was simply faster before 1972. We traded polluting flames for light to instant on-off uh, electric light. Uh, we traded in factory power with steam engines and leather belts uh, to electric machine tools and hand tools. Uh, instead of hot and cold homes and offices, we got central heating and air conditioning. Uh, instead of horses, we had motor vehicles, air travel, interstate highways. We went from 75 percent rural in 1870 to about 70 uh, percent urban by 1950. Uh, just a few more. We went from carrying pails of water to running water, outhouses to indoor bathrooms. Uh, when we talk about medical advance, the rate of improvement of life expectancy in the first half of the 20th century was double the rate of the last half of the 20th century, thanks to curing, conquering infant mortality. Uh, we got rid of child labor, and we went from isolation uh, to the telephone, the phonograph, radio, TV, and movies. So summing up, why was productivity growth faster before 1972. It's because the second industrial revolution of the late 19th century just involved so many different dimensions of 
invention spread across water and sewage and cleanliness and electricity and internal combustion engine and chemicals uh, and entertainment and communication. In contrast, the third industrial revolution of roughly the last 50 years has focused on one truly important general purpose technology, and that is digitalization. And here the important part point is how far along we are. Now this is just a summary of subtracting out from the initial 2.0 green growth rate, and we wind up with 0.2 for future disposable income of the bottom uh, 99%. Well, many innovations are going to occur over the next 40 years, and my forecast assumes that they're going to be as important as the one over the last 40 years. So I'm really sort of in the middle between the techno-optimists like Joel and Eric Brynjolfsson and the technological pessimists who, not me, say that innovation is going away. But I just want to remind you what's been invented in the last 40 years. And this is already past history. This isn't the future. PC, Internet, e-commerce, mobile phones, smartphones, iPads, digitalization of library catalogs and part catalogs and the, the availability of totally free information that Joel emphasizes that's all happened, revolution in office equipment and procedures, barcode scanning, the ATM machine, and all the wonders of uh, making possible leisure uh, consumption. Can future innovation be forecast in advance? Uh, I don't know if I got this from Joel or somebody. Any pessimist gazing into the future is condemned by a lack of imagination and doomed to repeat the mistakes of past pessimists. Well, I'm not actually a pessimist. I'm just forecasting that innovation's going to continue as it has been. Uh, but I want to emphasize that whether you're a techno-optimist or a te techno-pessimist, you are equally guilty of guesstimation and forecasting things that we cannot know about. And I don't think there's any asymmetry. When I hear Joel uh, raving about some of the things that he thinks are coming, and I'll get to this in my little rebuttal, um, uh, he's, he's guessing just as much as I am. So uh, Brynjolfsson and McAfee have written this big book called The Second Machine Age. They emphasize some of the same things that Joel did on his slide that he quickly passed by. Big data, small robots, driverless cars, trucks, and taxis, uh, and the medical miracles to be made possible uh, by the genome. Well, Eric and uh, Brynjolfsson and McAfee are particularly slippery about timing. They attribute to the future a lot of things that have already happened. For instance, quote from their book, Andy now sends Eric a file as an email attachment, whereas before he sent it as a floppy disk. Sorry, guys, we've been sending email attachments at least for 20 years, since 1993. Productivity growth, as you saw in the colored charts, has just not responded to the innovations of the last decade. And I think the innovations that happened before, 10 years ago, were just more important. We've now had 20 years of Google, uh, sorry, 20 years of Amazon, 16 years of Google. We've had 13 years of Wikipedia. I mean, that stuff is really old. Uh, so just to remind you, the last nine years have produced 1.3% growth rate in productivity, which, by the way, is substantially faster uh, than in the Eurozone. Uh, but let me, uh, right at the end, take a note of that green bar for the dot-com revolution. I'm going to give you three pieces of evidence that that was temporary and it's not coming back. The revival of productivity growth between 1996 and 2004. The first piece of evidence is the blue bar to the right. It didn't continue. Second piece of evidence is the growth of American manufacturing capacity, um, both just the percent growth in capacity and the growth of capacity per member of the working age uh, population. Slow explosive, slow again, and for the last two years, overall manufacturing capacity growth has been negative. Per capita, it's been negative for the last six years. I asked an expert, how come there's that big peak in 1998? Immediately, I got this chart back. Uh, this chart is the share of ICT manufacturing value added in total U.S. manufacturing. This huge peak between 1996 and 2001 and now we're back to where we were 40 years ago. Another reason why that dot-com revolution uh, was temporary. And the last piece of evidence is the rate of change of the uh, American deflator for information, communication, and technology uh, equipment, ICT. 
Uh, this started out around zero in the early 70s. It peaked at a price change, that is the price per unit of performance, of minus 14% in 1998. And now we're back practically to zero. So this is diminishing returns in the third uh, industrial revolution. Do I have any policy proposals? Yes, I have a lot. Some of them echo the last session. Demographics index the retirement age to life expectancy. Ignore Paul Krugman, uh, feeling sorry for manual workers. Uh, get decent health care for people in the bottom of the income distribution uh, to allow them to keep up with the improvement of life expectancy other people have been enjoying. Sharply raise quotas for legal immigration, starting with the most skilled, the people who want to buy their way in, and go down the income distribution. We need to repopulate our inner cities. Uh, and immigration, as the previous session commented, is the best way to deal with the dependency ratio. If we had listened to Milton Friedman in Capitalism and Freedom more than 50 years ago and legalized all drugs, as he and Gary Becker later uh, wrote about, we would have saved the lives of millions of young African-American males whose lives have been tainted by the stamp on their record that they were convicts, most of them nonviolent drug con uh, convicts. Education imposed higher standards in secondary school while investing in preschool to reduce the, the vocabulary gap. Uh, inequality start by returning capital gains and dividend tax rates to pre-1997 levels, get rid of the problem that Warren Buffett pays lower taxes than his secretary, make medical care a right of uh, citizenship, and get rid of, here I join together with Marty Feldstein and uh, a lot of other people, get rid of $1.6 trillion of tax loopholes, most of which go to higher income and the richest Americans. So if future innovations are less important than the 125 years we've just examined, uh, and especially if they're less important than the last 40 years, which I'm prepared uh, not to believe, all developed nations are going to be affected. But there's still plenty of room for catching up in the emerging markets. Notable is the fact that headwinds are clearly less of a problem in some other countries. We know Korea has an impending uh, demographic problem, but Korea and Canada have better education. Japan, Korea, France, and Scandinavia have less of a problem of inequality. Uh, and some of these countries have less of a burden of rising debt to GDP. So the assignment for our panel is discuss all of the above. And, and that assignment goes first to Yong Seok Shin. I wish I uh, heard about the assignment earlier, but um, I'm preparing a discussion for Professor Joe Moker uh, discussion uh, presentation. But given the discussion that Professor Gordon just gave, I'm not sure whether another discussion is necessary. But um, here it goes. I think actually there's a little bit of room for common grounds between the two presentations. So let me just quickly sum uh, up Professor Moker's arguments. Um, the future of technological progress is bright. Why? Because what's important for innovation is uh, the tools, toolkits for the science, and then also how freely and quickly information can be aggregated and retrieved and disseminated. Disseminated, and we've never had it better. So this sounds like great, and I think uh, the arguments actually are very convincing. So. I'm excited, and his presentation actually infected me with a sense of excitement, too. So um, this is a feature I want, and then this is the feature I want my children to be part of, too. Okay, so having said that, I think the first thing, this is a little bit of, um, I don't think I can reconcile the two viewpoints perfectly, but at least one thing I can say is that, well, one room for, ground, uh, room for conciliation here is that Professor Mokir is mostly talking about innovation, econo economically meaningful innovation, uh, whether that can be actually captured in a traditional national income and product accounting, that's a different matter. So in the models we write down, technological progress is by construction equal to uh, GDP growth because, well, that's the only thing that technology does. You produce more output given input. Okay, but especially the kind of technology we are seeing maybe national income product account will have more difficult time going forward than in the past in terms of capturing all the utility and welfare gains. Okay, this is a quote from Professor Mokir's uh, paper. 
whether technological progress will be accompanied by economic growth at, as traditionally measured is hard to know, but so what? What he means is that as long as it improves our lives and welfare and utility, and whether the GDP lacks, that's okay. I actually share a lot of this sentiment with one caveat, which I'll come back to in a bit. So there are a lot of interesting examples in the paper. And then uh, Professor Gordon also had a lot of more additional uh, examples of technological progress in the past industrial revolutions. So I pick a few more that, um, which I find interesting. So some of the things that I think about as I age too. So the medical service, the big breakthrough seems to be that uh, with the advanced in genetics and also immuno-oncology, now very personalized tailor-made treatments possible, ma uh, made afford affordably, uh, made possible for many patients. That sounds like uh, it will enhance our life expectancy and make us more productive. But this will not be fully captured by the typical, uh, the conventional ways of measuring natural income product count because medical service typically is uh, valued at cost uh, rather than because we really don't have a good way of capturing all the value added. And also, if this leads to a lot of people, that we talked about demographics, healthy old gentlemen walking around, not producing anything, the national income, uh, it's, it's a good thing. It's a very happy thing for, uh, well, I think I'll be very happy when I'm 70 and I get walk, walking around and um, I'm very healthy. That's a great thing. But it's not going to be captured by the GDP measures in the conventional way. So I think that's one example I think of. Utility and welfare uh, will be, could be very much... Um, uh, undermeasured if you use the conventional national income product accounting, and I think that's part of what Professor Mock is saying when he says he doesn't care about whether it's captured or not. Quality of leisure, that's another thing. Um, as many of other, uh, my own countrymen, I don't consume leisure, so I don't know, I cannot attest to this personally, but well, from people who do, uh, there's one example where actually time spent on computer, like internet, has overtaken as the number one uh, leisure activity for average American uh, since like 2008 or so. Um, it used to be TV watching, but now it's actually the internet. And there has been, in that, that, since then, there has been, depending on how you measure it, about six to tenfold increase in global internet traffic. It's a huge increase. Oh, I'm sure it's, some of these are cross fertilization of ideas, used for research and innovation, but most of this is just people having really good time. Uh, at very low cost. And the reason why it's, part of the reason why it's so low cost is that, well, consumers, we are the content providers, right? So you use Facebook and then what well, you provide and your friends and your relatives are providing the content. Uh, so it's free in that sense. So these are, you're having a good time, but this is for, because it's a leisure consumption and also because the price is not really reflecting very well, partly because you are also putting input into this production of leisure, um, this will not be captured well uh, in the GDP measures. This is one uh, example I like because I think it's a very powerful uh, thing here. So the fact is that the Earth receives, uh, the, the amount of energy the Earth receives from the sun in one hour is equivalent to all the energy that all the human beings on the Earth are consuming in an entire year. So to me, that sounds like a great deal if you can somehow find a way to economically harness the power of the solar uh, energy. And the, what the imagination here is that people are thinking that going forward, every home office in the U.S. will be equipped with efficient solar panels that will be enough to uh, use all, uh, provide all the energy that you will ever need, uh, especially if you drive electric cars. So it's a basically energy as a home production. So this is not going to be captured by national income product accounting in the traditional sense, but this is a wonderful thing. And um, some estimate shows that in some regions in the U United States, like I guess Nevada and New Mexico, where it's a lot of sun, sunny days, uh, so solar will hit parity with the coal in cost per megawatt hour produced by 2016. So it's a lot of great things. It's, of course, I'm cherry picking some of the examples where utility work begins a lot larger than what could be captured by GDP increases in the traditional sense, okay? So I'm agreeing with that. So, so one thing I'm already, the one asterisk I had about this sentiment that, well, if GDP doesn't capture, as long as it like, makes everybody happy and higher welfare, who cares, right? But I think the question is whose welfare are we talking about? And here I'm a little bit more uh, 
cautious and are not so optimistic about the future and shares this a little bit with Professor Gordon's sentiment in inequality. So, so now the, one of the important topics that we're talking about nowadays is inequality. And it's in the U.S., it's a well-known fact, top 1% income share rose dramatically since 1970 uh, to the level that only observed in the uh, Gilded Age. And then CEO to median employee pay ratio for, if you average over the SP500 companies, it was about 20 in 1950s. Now you reach 204 in 2013. It was actually about 120 in 2000. So within the last, that ratio has almost doubled in the last 10 years or so. Okay. And so we talk about inequality a lot. So I did actually some uh, decomposition myself. And if you look at all the wage inequality in the United States, so the growth in wage inequality since 1980, uh, you can group people by skills, by educational attainment, for example. And then you can ask how much of that actually came from between group, is it a college premium, for example, is it between group inequality increase or within group uh, wage inequality? It turns out actually most of, about 40% of the total increase in wage inequality comes from the high, within high school group wage inequality. There's a huge dispersion, uh, increase in dispersion in high school wage. Um, and I work at Walsh here, so I kind of know it a little bit better than other people do. Um, sorry for the insider joke. Okay. So, but maybe actually the disruptive technological progress, um, there's something about technological progress and inequality. So, of course, then we have to talk about why initially the, all the technological progress uh, spurred by the second industrial revolution actually didn't increase the uh, inequality. So I don't know for sure, but there are some hypotheses. So initially, with the mass production, so Henry Ford Model T, for example, you hire all these guys who are not that skilled, but then they produce cars and then they get paid decently. So that kind of things contribute to uh, the rise of American middle class. But it seems like with the new technological revolution, the middle is missing out. It's well documented, these job polarization stories, where one hypothesis is that, well, maybe these middle school jobs are replaced by automation. This is routinization hypothesis by uh, Otto levy Monet, Or maybe it is uh, replaced by trade with China, another popular hypothesis. And in that, I guess in the latter case, the technological progress is not raising the American middle class is raising the Chinese middle class. So in global sense, maybe it's a good thing. Okay, so with the new technology, even the mid upper middle class is not safe. So there's a site called LegalZoom.com. So basically where you go and you can get uh, very standardized legal uh, contracts and wills and uh, real estate purchase agreements and stuff very cheaply without involving a lawyer. And some people actually contribute we're accused that LegalZoom.com can account for about 30% of fall in the legal fees in the last 10 years or so, is a one single site. And then another fact is that the market always responds. So the law school application in the U.S. has plummeted by about 40% since the, in the last 10 years or so, uh, about seven years or so uh, since the peak. So, so typically lawyers you thought, think of like a prison of the, the safe pathway to upper middle class, but well, it's not true anymore. And what personally affects me more, I guess, is the rise of online education. There's so much uncertainty about how much uh, effect it will have, but the consensus seems to be it will mostly affect the second and third tier universities uh, because people can just pay money to watch a superstar professor from like Northwestern giving lectures in economic history rather than uh, listening to some uh, adjunct giving lectures in their own universities. So. So technology seems like very disruptive. And, well, you could have said, well, maybe it's very disruptive to you as a worker, but maybe it's beneficial for everybody in terms of the consumer. But if you look at the facts, that's not even clear. The advances in medical services and also this digitalized leisure activity seems to be very sharply correlated with the income and ed education level. So not everybody is really taking advantage of really uh, the main well, one of the m most famous uh, advances in technology in the recent years. Okay. So now I'm going to shift the gears. I'm going to look at a very long, have a long view, and I also have changed the unit of analysis. So before I was talking about the American cross-section inequality, but it kind of dawned upon me that, well, maybe there's something to look, look at. So the long view is that Paul Byrock, economic historian, kind of estimates that the living standards 
was about the same in Rome, first century, and Arab Caliphate, China, and India, and, up, and also up to early 18th century Europe, Western Europe. We're talking about the average output, average income per capita, obviously. And then, not only that, the cross-sectional differences in income per capita were across countries in average income per capita, average income per capita was a factor of two. Okay? So this is a very little inequality. Okay, first of all, level, it was very stagnant, and then in terms of cross-sectional inequality, there's not much difference, and it's comparing across countries. And then after 1820, the first industrial revolution, well, now you see huge divergence in income across countries, average income across countries. And in 2005, the, you look at a country at the 90th percentile and 10th percentile, the ratio is at 45. The issue about two, now it's 45. So technological progress and Rising inequality, well, maybe it has something to do with uh, what we can learn from income average income distribution across countries. Okay. So, so what I said so far is that, well, okay, as Professor Mokio suggested, maybe GDP will not capture um, all the gains in uh, utility and welfare. Okay, that's a fact. And secondly, well, maybe it will rise to more inequality. But... I was thinking about it, and my take is that, well, maybe those facts will have some, may have, depending on how we react to them, may have a negative impact on innovation itself. Okay, so first of all, so if it is true that policymakers forget the fact that uh, true economic growth is not captured by these GDP measures, and especially you come from a country like Korea where you, you are so used to growing at like 6% per year, then maybe you feel like, oh, I have to do something. And maybe you will do something really nice and useful for the economy if you find the uh, market frictions and market failures. But sometimes you, the history also teaches us that, well, you may actually do something what you think is a well-intended policy that may only distort innovative efforts or research allocation. So that's something I want to be cautious about. And also, given all the buzzword of inequality or the uh, attention paid to inequality, well, maybe policymakers kind of... Uh, uh, it's, I don't want to be <laughs> apologist for the top 1%, especially when I'm not part of the top 1%, but uh, maybe you may actually overreact by having a wrong tax transfer policies that diminish incentives to acquire human capital and innovate, and then they may have dire consequences for technological progress. And also, now people seem to be like, oh, focused on this inequality at the top, and then maybe it will just give, us, uh, give rise to very wasteful competition for status, or instead of really truly innovating, you're just going to do rent-seeking activity like a patent trolling or uh, intellectual uh, monopoly losses. Okay? So finally, I think I agree with Professor Merkel that unless we use really distortive policies to handle all the things that we saw, uh, I think that the future of technological innovation is bright. Whether that translates to major GDP, that I'm not so sure, and also what I'm not sure is that whether everybody, everyone will actually fully benefit from all this technology. Okay? I think things look good for all the audience members today because, well, you are all highly educated professionals and what we know from intergener inter intergenerational persistence of ability and income potentials, I think this is good for your children too. Um, as I was talking about like average income across countries, the slow pace of a cross-country convergence since 1980s and it cautions me that maybe the future technology benefit may not trickle down uh, as rap rapidly as we hoped. Okay? Thank you. Mark Spiegel. So uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to uh, discuss Bob's uh, very interesting and important work. And... Uh, um, the disclaimer that uh, my views are my own and not those of the Federal Reserve certainly applies in this context. So the way I'm going to organize my talk today is uh, to basically talk about Bob's most recent paper uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, the previous one. The most recent paper, uh, as, as Bob said, is kind of a follow-up to his original paper where he expressed a lot of skepticism about uh, the prospects for U.S. growth largely based on um, uh, the prospects for information technology advancement and, and TFP growth, but then also pointing out a number of headwinds. And, and what Bob talks about in this most recent paper 
is that he kind of reverses it and says, you know, in fact, the headwinds that I was talking about, that he was talking about, uh, are actually relatively uncontroversial. So he highlights the, pa the headwinds in this paper and uh, then talks a little bit about information technology, and I'm going to organize my comments accordingly. So as Bob said, what he's talking, he um, is, is a rather pessimistic outlook for U.S. growth going forward, as we all know, uh, numbers such as 0.9% GDP per capita growth, um, and then in terms of uh, inequality, a much lower number for the lowest 99%. And he identifies these four headwinds, first demographics that we've been talking about all afternoon today, uh, about both the baby boom as uh, the, the, the retirement of the baby boomers, as well as changes in labor force participation. Um, he also talks about educational attainment, uh, increased inequality, and the increased debt to GDP ratio uh, as an argument that fiscal retrenchment is due, which will also weigh on GDP growth. So in terms of uh, Bob's paper, he, he talks about an organizing principle, which I think is a really useful way to think about uh, the arguments he's making. So in terms, so he thinks about output uh, per person as uh, a decomposition in terms of output per hour and the number of hours worked per person. And so demography, he's going to argue, is going to weigh on the number of hours per person. As he's saying, uh, the uh, elderly retired people will grow in numbers and someone will have to pay uh, for the work that they're no longer doing. Uh, in terms of educational attainment, uh, we'll see a decline in the growth of output per hours as uh, efficient labor units growth will, will, will uh, decrease uh, over time. And um, also the growth in R&D uh, might go down because there will be less uh, uh, inputs in terms of uh, human capital into that into R&D activity. Um, he also argues that there's going to be uh, increases in inequality, um, and that will increase for the bottom 99% income uh, per hour, um, and, or, or alternatively, if you prefer looking at it that way, decreasing the rate of median growth for the United States. Um, finally, there's uh, the idea of a fiscal, the fiscal burden, uh, the increased uh, debt to GDP ratio, decreasing disposable income over time uh, in the U.S. Uh, population. So let me turn to the uh, headwinds uh, one at a time. Um, in terms of the demographics, uh, I think it's diff and we've talked about this this afternoon, it's difficult to argue that there's not some degree of weighing on U.S. growth prospects from the current demographic position that we face. Indeed, the uh, baby boomer retirement and uh, decreased uh, labor force participation rates that we've observed are likely to drag on output. As Bob points out in the paper, um, we already had this, uh, what was called earlier, a demographic dividend of entry of females into the labor force that's not likely to be repeated again. And so those kinds of uh, negative uh, um, factors, according to demographics, are indeed, at least in my opinion, compelling to weigh to some extent on uh, future growth. However, I think there are some open questions that we leave ourselves with uh, in terms of demographics. First uh, and foremost, perhaps in my mind, is this idea of labor force participation rates. Um, you know, we, we already talked about the idea, and there's been a lot of debate uh, in the press and, and in, in uh, central banks as well, about how much of uh, the labor force uh, participation decline, that should be a downward sloping arrow, uh, 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 but how much is going to go up with cyclical recovery, I'm sorry. And uh, as the paper suggests, a lot of this uh, decline that we've observed to date are among uh, prime working age portions of the population, uh, as well as among the young. And I think it's a very open question at this point in terms of how long can these cohorts stay out of the labor force uh, as the economy approves. Uh, it seems uh, to me quite likely that at least some component of these people that currently uh, report themselves as being out of the labor force are likely to re-enter the labor force as the prospects for employment for them get better. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, the idea of immigration that we've all talked about already as well. Uh, clearly, immigration for the United States is not going to resolve the whole demographic issue, but it, it likely will have some kind of mitigation effect on overall problems. One thing that Bob didn't talk about, although someone allu alluded to it earlier uh, in the context of demographics, 
uh, is this idea of the financial implications of demographics. Um, and so I hate to give Bob a reason to be more pessimistic, but uh, this is an additional uh, feature that people have talked about. Um, this is a picture from uh, just a little economic letter I did with Cheng Lu. Uh, and basically what we did was just extend uh, some pictures that people like uh, Andrew Abel and Jim Paterba were working on uh, at the beginning of the last decade, kind of asking the question, does this feature uh, in U.S. demographics still hold? Uh, after the, the boom and the bust of the last decade. And lo and behold, it does. You can see that really over the last uh, 60 years, there's a very surprising and, and somewhat inexplicable tight correlation between uh, measures of the dependency ratio in the U.S. population and the price-earnings ratio in U.S. equity markets. Uh, this is kind of surprising and, and hard to explain. Uh, there, people tell stories about as people approach retirement, they move into safer securities uh, or, or different types of assets. Um, but indeed, if, if you believe this uh, pattern and you believe that this pattern is likely to continue, then the projection for demographics also suggests an additional weighing uh, concern uh, on U.S. prospects going forward, namely uh, decline in asset markets, at least in terms of the price-earnings ratio. It's also clear that U.S. education growth has slowed. As uh, Bob pointed out, in terms of years of schooling, um, you know, the U.S. Uh, population has largely achieved uh, levels of schooling uh, that are not likely to be widely uh, surpassed in the coming years. Although, uh, as someone pointed out in the earlier session, as life expectancy increases, it might well be the case that years of schooling starts to pick up again. But one thing um, that we haven't talked about is the rest of the world. And so uh, while U.S. Uh, years of schooling has declined over time, it's certainly the case there's a large capacity for further increases in years of schooling from people in the rest of the world. And while this won't directly impact, of course, on the human capital stock of the United States, uh, at least uh, abstracting from immigration, uh, there is the potential for increased R&D in the rest of the world. And I'll come back to that uh, later. I have less to say about the other two headwinds uh, inequality and the debt to GDP ratio. Um, in terms of inequality, I think it's a very important point, and uh, I, I think that in particular the idea of median growth rates as some kind of a measure of economic performance is a very interesting one, but I think it's kind of a different question. So um, I'm not, I'm not going to talk much about that. I do want to talk a little bit about the government debt to GDP, uh, the fourth headwind. Um, the idea here uh, basically is the idea that in terms of uh, government spending, we're living beyond our means, and there will need to be some retrenchment in the future that will uh, exacerbate inequality and lead to a drag on uh, growth. Um, so first of all, one of my comments is that although we all know that the current uh, projected picture for U the U.S. fiscal situation is uh, one uh, that looks uh, troubling. It looks troubling partly because of the fact that there are built into this projection increases in government spending, both on health care and on Social Security spending. So to some extent, um, the, pro the reason the government uh, position looks troubling is because of the fact that we expect more government spending going forward. And so uh, it's not clear uh, what the growth implications would be of the needed fiscal adjustment. But in addition, uh, here's a picture that's going to surprise nobody. Um, this is just a simple scatter plot uh, over the last 100 years of um, uh, debt-to-GDP ratios in the United States against the next 10 years of growth. And you could indeed see that, and this, of course, includes some episodes where debt-to-GDP ratios were very high, such as after World War II, and uh, basically there's no correlation whatsoever. So there's very little predictive capacity of uh, U.S. debt-to-GDP ratios on future growth. Um, that's not so surprising, of course, because as we all well understand, particularly in uh, this part of the world, um, the U.S. government has succeeded in finding people elsewhere who are quite willing to hold uh, U.S. government paper. And so the real kind of constraint, I think, that um, 
the U.S. government is facing is not one of uh, its debt-to-GDP ratio, but of the economy as a whole living beyond its means. If we want to ask that kind of a question, it's probably more useful to think in terms of the U.S. net international investment position. Um, in terms of the NIIP, um, uh, many of you might be familiar with uh, this sort of improvement in the NIIP during the boom years, uh, a, a series of papers by uh, Pierre-Olivier Gorincha and Ellen Ray talking about exorbitant privilege and uh, advantages that were enjoyed by uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, those periods. Um, with the crisis, uh, however, uh, well, after an initial period where savings rates in the U.S. went up, um, uh, we again see in, in the current re uh, recovery uh, a somewhat uh, in, uh, resumption of uh, deterioration in the U.S. net international investment position. So in this case, this might be considered something of a headwind, but it's certainly not uh, increasing at a rate that I think people would find particularly troubling or in any sense um, indicative of some need for an imminent retrenchment in the U.S. position. Let me turn now to uh, the innovation uh, um, uh, slowdown. So as, as Bob said, uh, and I think his point's well taken, uh, you know, there was this uh, substantive period of uh, in Internet-led productivity increase from about the mid-'90s to uh, the middle of the last decade, uh, but that was much shorter in duration than the what he called the second industrial revolution, and uh, uh, although it was of a quite some, uh, um, impressive magnitude. Uh, one thing that's interesting about that episode is that there was a uh, notable lag between the uh, innovation and the implementation. So in particular, as Bob points out in the paper, um, things like the share of information and communication technology declined earlier than uh, what we saw in terms of the decline in growth of productivity. Uh, there are other kinds of uh, technological issues uh, that we see implemented with lags. For example, air airport kiosk uh, check-in stands are based on a very old technology. So that leaves open the, the idea that, you know, maybe we have yet to see uh, the fruits of, informa of uh, information technology advancements that have been made since that period. That's an open question. But in terms of the numbers that we have seen, I think they support uh, Bob's uh, contention that um, we definitely see in the data that there's been not only, we all know of, about a substantive decline in the growth of labor productivity, but also these are numbers uh, from a study by uh, Byrne, Oliner, and Sickle a notable decline in the contribution of IT to those growth rates. So indeed, uh, you know, th that is something that we see in the data, that um, I guess one way to put it would be that the golden days of uh, the, the IT productivity increase, uh, maybe about a, uh, that lasted about a decade, uh, that, that um, increase, at least over that period of time, appears to have been exhausted. However, um, this is a, a, a beautiful picture that I stole from a colleague, John Fernald, and it's, a, it's from a paper co-authored with Chad Jones that's going to appear in uh, this year's uh, AER uh, proceedings issue. Um, uh, it's not clear what's going to happen going forward. So you could think of this declining uh, period here is kind of the Tyler Cowen, or as, as we've discussed today, the, the period of uh, thinking about um, in the past uh, ideas uh, as being one uh, issues of harvesting the low-lying fruit. So you could think of, you know, long, long time ago, you just took a rock and threw it at a moose or something, and that's not too hard to figure out. But then over time, uh, those ideas have already been, uh, uh, you know, developed, and new ideas are harder to come by. As uh, Chad and uh, John point out, however, it's by no means, and, and, and to some extent, Professor Mokir's talk about today, about in terms of uh, technological advancements feeding on themselves in terms of scientific endeavor, uh, it's not, by no means clear that that's going to be the nature of the pattern going forward. So uh, Chad, Chad and John talk about, well, perhaps we'll have an inflection point, but we'll actually see a period of increasing returns. Alternatively, maybe it'll get really easy, but we'll run out of ideas. And, or there might be waves of general purpose technology innovations. And, and, and these are, you know, very uncertain. And indeed, one thing you're confronted by when you look at this literature is there's a lot of uncertainty across these studies in terms of um, 
what we expect to happen. So um, finally, uh, I also think it's important to think about the rest of the world. So uh, the rest of the world, uh, you know, education, as I already showed you, is growing b rapidly. And indeed, R&D uh, expenditures in some parts of the rest of the world are already growing rapidly. And, and as, as we know, um, ideas, as, as Bob was saying, from the U.S. are non-rivalrous. And so to some extent, the U.S. Uh, might benefit from growth in R&D expenditure from the rest of the world. So, you know, uh, uh, Bob was talking about uh, the U.S. Uh, as, as being, uh, the fortunes of the U.S. as being important for the rest of the world in the context of uh, the idea that the U.S. is the innovator and maybe at the frontier and uh, innovating ideas in the rest of the world, adopting those ideas uh, from the U.S. Uh, I'm very sympathetic. I have a model like that with Jess Benaby in the growth handbook. But I think that if going forward, we're going to have a less of a world where the U.S. is the leader and more of a multipolar world where R&D activity is taking place um, uh, not only in the U.S., but in other places. And, and these aren't necessarily just uh, uh, foreign companies innovating and sending ideas back to the U.S. These could well be U.S. companies uh, placed in both the United States and elsewhere developing ideas. Uh, I particularly wanted to show this graph because I, I thought people would find it interesting here that a long time ago South Korea passed the United States in terms of R&D expenditure as a share of GDP. So, and indeed, as we all can see here, China's coming on strong, and of course, the denominator there, GDP, is also growing rapidly in China. So um, we could well have a substantive number of, uh, you know, Chinese uh, scientists running around innovating going forward, a and one could envision a world where uh, the gap between the United States and the rest of the world is not as big as it used to be, and yet the uh, U.S. Uh, growth rate need not decline as a result. So let me, uh, uh, just to, to frame this problem, uh, let's, let's think about, um, so where does Bob's numbers stand relative to a lot of the literature? I think, frankly, um, they're coming around to his way of thinking, uh, if anything, at a slow pace, uh, in the sense that a lot of these numbers are lower than they used to be for these various studies. But still, there's a gap. And so um, people like Sickle have a number of like 1.8. Uh, my colleague John Fernald in a, in a recent paper is talking about 1.9. Bob said he's, he's at 1.3. Jorgensen, a little more optimistic, is 1.93. Um, but the thing I want to most uh, point out is that uh, Sickle, uh, looking at, his, looking at a, a positive and a negative scenario, comes up with a very wide confidence band. Numbers like uh, uh, 0.88 uh, to 2.82. Uh, a similar study by Mueller and Watson uh, using very different technology, they come up with a confidence interval like 1% to 3%. So there's a lot of, as, as I showed you in that picture about ideas, there's a lot of uncertainty about how this might go. And I think we really are, although this is quite an important question, we really are quite uncertain as to what the answers are going to be. So I'm running out of time, so, so let me just conclude. I uh, think uh, both of these are uh, very interesting papers. Um, and I think, uh, unfortunately, Bob probably is getting the sign right uh, in terms of uh, U.S. productivity is likely to slow, uh, at least in the immediate future, uh, relative to the exceptional pace that it exhibited between 1996 and 2004. Um, and, and indeed, uh, it's clear that some of the headwinds that Bob talked about are indeed, uh, at least in the near future, uh, strong ones. Um, uh, the, other quite, the other two I'm a little less certain about. Thank you very much. Much as the authors would like a rebuttal round, I do not see how we can do that in the um, 10 minutes at the most. Uh, available to us. So let's collect a uh, couple of questions, and I promise we'll leave you uh, a couple of minutes to respond to one another as well as to the floor. So um, the floor is open. There, there was nothing provocative, I presume, in the preceding presentations. Going once. 
going twice. This, this, I, I do not see a hand. This may be an unprecedented uh, uh, event for this duo especially. So, Joel, you want to go first? Uh, yes. Um, so so let, me, let me try to... And remember our time constraints. And remember time constraints. Um, it's, let me say two or three things about Bob, who's my colleague at Northwestern and has been for 40, for, and my friend for 40 years. But we can, these are hard issues on which reasonable people can disagree, particularly when they look at it from different point of views. But there's two th or three things about Bob's kind of approach and other approaches much like it that should be pointed out. The first is, and I think uh, Young Sok Shin said this very well, we are a little bit prisoners of our uh, national income accounting technology and the way we think about quantifying innovation. Uh, these things, in my view, work quite well if, if for the kind of short-term comparisons um, that we do over a business cycle. I, t I think they tend to lose their content over uh, a much longer time frame and that they really become uh, rather meaningless uh, in terms of, uh, you know, centuries uh, of economic growth and productivity change and, um, you know, we can, it's not really about productivity growth, it's about changing consumer surplus. Now, I realize full well that the consumer surplus has changed a lot in the past century, and I'm not saying that it will change slower or faster in the foreseeable future. I just say we don't know, and that predictions about GDP growth or its derivatives, so, so, such as TFP, uh, don't tell us very much about what's happening uh, uh, with consumer surplus. Secondly, um, I think Bob's kind of thinking, in my view, reveals a certain lack of technological imagination uh, in the sense that, for instance, he talks about computers as if what was really important is information technology and communications technology. But the last five or ten years we've seen, and this came out in, the, in some of the commentators' uh, uh, remarks, that it isn't about information technology. It's about the digitalization of everything. And uh, it's true, you know, some of these things have been going on for a long time, but, but three-dimensional printing has not. That may well be the next frontier, uh, and we've just seen this in the very, very beginning of it. Um, even more powerful is the advent of robotization. I think as far as robotization is concerned, we are now where computers were in the 1960s. We, had no, we have no clue where it's going to go, uh, but uh, by so any reasonable extrapolation, um, it, it will simply change things uh, uh, hugely. Finally, I want to say something about labor force participation, which seems to be such a bugaboo. And, you know, in 1972, when I was a graduate student, um, uh, two economists at Yale, Nordhaus and Tobin, wrote a famous paper in which they suggested uh, some, uh, that national income accounting, at the very least, uh, uh, worry about leisure. And uh, I don't know what to think about people who say growth is going down because labor, for t live, labor force participation is going down. I don't know why these people are not working. Is this, to what extent is this voluntary? To what extent is this, is this, is this involuntary? Um, what I do know is that, it, that one of the areas in which technology has been most dramatic in the 20th century is in fact, and, this, and Young Suk Shin referred to this, is in fact in the technology which we have available to us uh, to enjoy leisure. And so the uh, marginal rate of substitution between leisure and income must be changing in a dramatic, in a dramatic way simply because you know, not working is not what it used to be. Uh, there are lots of things to do that are enjoyable, and I can quite well imagine uh, that part of the resistance we had about this morning about you know, uh, uh, delaying the age of retirement is based on that. People want to retire not because they want to sit at home and do nothing, but because there is just so much to do which we couldn't do before. I fail to see how any kind of uh, national income accounting uh, uh, framework can, can account for this. Uh, nor is it designed to. Uh, so I'm, I remain very optimistic about the future. One final point. Bob, you should 
keep in mind, this came out in, in the two commentators as well, the United States ain't the world. I know it seems like that in Evanston, Illinois, but it isn't. Uh, it may well be that, our, some, that our, some of our educational standards are falling, but these PISA counts are all relative, and we all know that this is a, you know, a, a, a completely a sort of a positional game we're playing here. Uh, if the United States were to lose some of its technological uh, leadership, uh, all that would mean is it would go somewhere else. But in fact, technology is so globalized today that even if it were to pass, that the United States will no longer be in a position where, it was, where it's been for most of the 20th century, that doesn't mean that we will not be able to enjoy uh, the fruits of other people's R&D just as for a century they have been able to enjoy ours. Just what I said, it's a free good. Uh, it doesn't matter where it's invented. Uh, Mark, right. thank you for your excellent uh, uh, discussion. Uh, you explained my uh, thoughts uh, in a new and different way, and I didn't find anything to disagree about, except at the very end when you contrast uh, Fernal, Jorgensen, et cetera's future productivity. Everybody else does the private economy. I do only the total economy. The, the government household sector grows slower. That gap is between 0.3 and 0.5. And I was on a session with Dale Jorgensen in Philadelphia in January, and he said, isn't it amazing? I'm predicting 1.3 for the total time, and this is what Bob is predicting. And he thought that was a remarkable coincidence. So that number of years is obsolete. A common theme in this session and others is that GDP is understated and cannot uh, does not reflect all of the information that we're getting, um, or indeed some of the new inventions that have made leisure more pleasant. But I would like to... tends to attribute to the future what has already happened uh, in the past. And um, looking at his papers that are backups and that are in your binder, uh, he says, one exciting development is that more and more work can be done at a distance. Well, like Google, like Amazon, that all happened 15 years ago. Where's the examples that have to do with the future? The only thing he has to say about the headwinds, is that he has become a leading cheerleader for increased leisure without pausing to ask how we're going to pay for all that leisure. He ignores the research of Valerie Ramey that shows how little change in leisure actually happened uh, in the 20th century, as well as surveys of retire, retirees who after a year or two uh, discovered that they are totally bored. Uh, he's optimistic that robots will soon go where we, quote, go where we cannot go, and perform household tasks of any kind. Uh, I highly invite him to read the Wall Street Journal review of robot vacuum cleaners from six weeks ago that declared they were incompetent and not ready for prime time. And, and finally, uh, he writes, non-knowledge workers are being robotized at a rapid pace that is indeed true in manufacturing where there is no productivity slowdown, as well as in wholesalers like Amazon. But in the other 80% of the economy, robots are hardly making a dent. And I invite you, when you go into the supermarket the next time, to find if anyone other than an ordinary human being is restocking the shelves. My last words are thank you. I, I think that's the last word for now, but uh, it will not be the, uh, the last word once dinner starts. So. Thank you very much. Um, this concludes the first day of the conference. Uh, thank you for all your participation and the discussions.
Uh, we saw very interesting uh, flows of uh, ideas and the insights on growth, population aging, and the prospects of uh, growth engines along the road. Thank you so much.